Since the mystery of the stranger has a whole lot of clues, we'll start in at the beginning. And even the beginning was exciting. If you lived in a little town where nothing interesting had happened since Mrs. Brewster horsewhipped her husband in 1887, well, we were hanging around the store just about as usual that autumn when Tom Binford, the carpenter, turned from his mailbox holding up a big fat letter from the city. Naturally, we went right over, except Lou Coon, who wasn't very right in his head. But here was the letter. Dear sir, you are to carry out these plans without making the slightest change of any kind. After you have finished the house, notify me and I will move in at once. It seemed that somebody in Chicago had bought West Larrabee's land and paid for a house to be built on it, just like ordering a tin bathtub from the mail order house. Because there was no snow before December that year, the house was finished and the man notified like it said in the letter. And at 4.10 in the morning when Benny Andrews was picking up the morning papers from the city, a little man in a black overcoat appeared on the platform carrying two big wooden boxes. He had marched right past Benny without so much as nodding and piles his boxes in back of the wagon. He doesn't speak to Mac Williams either, but hands him a piece of paper. And a moment later, Benny sees them silently driving off in the dark. Just before dawn, they pull up at the house, looking white as a ghost in the gloom. And Mac figures that now he'll be able to find out why that house has four bedrooms, a front and back parlor, and a sewing room, all for one man. But Mac got nowhere, for the stranger took the boxes from him and went in alone, walking up the path, still as silent as the dead. Not a thing for Mac to see but the big house looking bare and empty as ever. Two weeks later, he still hadn't stirred out. But to catch up with my story again, Mrs. Brewster here, the one that's driving, was never stumped. She was the one who'd horsewhipped her first husband for drinking in 87. Well, she baked up her best macaroon four-decker and just came calling. It was proper, all right, since we always waited two weeks before visiting the newcomers. She and Lib Smith figured on going right inside. For mind you, until now, nobody had even got a good look at his face. Bang! The door right in her face. Well, that was the nearest anybody got to being inside that house in 1893. Because if Mrs. Brewster was licked, so was everybody. Early that fall, though, a bombshell blew up right in the store. In from the city intended for the stranger came clothes for a young woman. Shoes with real French heels. Stockings. And they were made of silk. A party dress for a little girl, about size eight, with fancy ruffles. A boy's sailor suit, size seven. And a whole pack of those white cotton gloves, like pallbearers wear at a funeral. Even our doctor, a fine educated man, was curious now about those gloves. They were picking into everything, goods for a whole family, and not a soul but the stranger had set a foot in that house since it was built. Suddenly, <coughs> just as calm as ice, he had stepped right into the store. And for a long time, nobody could think of a word to say. Mrs. Brewster suddenly exploded. Say, what's going on? We all waited for his reply. There was none. Just another of those cards. And we couldn't help moving down to the window and staring out after him. And then... Oh! Holy 
jumping Jerusalem. And there for five solid years, until Christmas Eve of 1897, stood the Bridgewood Mystery. And we just about accepted it as the eighth wonder of the world. But that night, the doctor was coming home from a 10-mile sick call when, lo and behold, he was crumpled up on the stairs like a man that had fallen from paralysis or maybe a stroke. Yet when he saw Doc Peabody, he kind of lunged to his feet and went for that door. But crazy or not, he was a stricken man and that made it the Doc's business. And he went on in face to face with the biggest adventure of his life. Only later did the doc find out that the horse had bolted when the glass broke and loped straight for town. And the cat was out of the bag when Mac Williams started to leave, looked out and saw the empty buggy and turned back and shouted, there's been an accident. Since the doc had been seen coming toward the stranger's house, there was a general exodus from town, like there was a flood or a house afire. In 30 minutes, there wasn't a soul that could walk or crawl that wasn't on the way. It was like the departure of the Israelites from bondage. He's murdered Doc Peabody, screams Mrs. Brewster. And we went through that gate like a hot knife through butter. But suddenly there's the Doc himself barring the door. Go back home, he says. I know the secret, but I can't tell. Never. A big surge like a wave hit the Doc then and we poured past him into the house. Everybody was there now but Lib Smith. But they tell me that she got up from her deathbed and just made it, running like a deer. What did we see? Well, it's crazy, it's unbelievable, but it's true. And it was sad, too. A regular parlor back there, except those carpenter tools. But the stunner was what was in it. They never moved nor spoke. So natural you could almost see them breathe or watch the lashes flutter. They were hollow wooden dolls. Very solemn, the doc holds something up and speaks quietly to Mrs. Brewster. And in just one minute, the whole thing was cleared up. The stranger had showed him all about it at last. This is her, the real one, I mean, when she was alive. You remember? That's the Thompson girl that went to Chicago 20 years ago. This is them when they were married. And this is her and their children on their anniversary, the same day it happened. A fire. They were trapped upstairs and they were burned to death. He got home, he rushed in, and he was so badly burned that his hands hardly ever even looked human again. And the hot fumes in his lungs made him lose the power of speech. But his wife loved Bridgewood, you see, and she was homesick, and he'd always promised that someday they'd live here. Well, he tried to keep his word. Poor, wild-minded man that had got something hurt beside his hands in that fire. He'd got that twisted soul that had made him try to rebuild what was dead and gone from him and keep it with him forever. And that's the story. He got well, all right, and until he died and we buried him on the hill as one of our own, he was the best cabinet maker this town ever had. We were glad to get the mystery off our minds, but somehow life has never been so interesting in Bridgewood since the day that letter came in from the incredible stranger.